Hello and welcome to this edition of Dr. Clark Reports. I'm your host, Dr. Gary Clark, and my guest is my friend, retired Judge Carolyn Gill Jefferson. And yes, uh, Judge Jefferson, greetings and welcome. Thank you for having me, Dr. Clark. Yes, it's yes. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, yes. And you know, um, uh, it's, we've known each other for so many years, but would you please tell uh, my view and audience about the, uh, when you were, when you served as, uh, as uh, judge with the uh, Civil District Court, what that was like and how did you enjoy uh, that particular period on the bench? Well, I was elected in March of 1994 uh, for an unexpired term, and then I had a two-year um, two-year term, and then election in 1996, and I served until um, 2006, and it was an absolutely wonderful experience. It was an opportunity to serve the people of New Orleans oh, yeah. after they had elected me. Um, and I heard cases from the smallest amounts involved, and certainly those family law cases too, which is important to our community. But it was a wonderful experience, as I said, because I got the opportunity to also um, have my dream come true, because I wanted to be a judge, and, and the people of New Orleans um, gave me the opportunity to do so. My colleagues were always engaging, had an opportunity to learn from them as well. But I think the most uh, rewarding experience was to be able to make decisions that impacted uh, the citizens of New Orleans in various kinds of ways, including their own personal lives and decisions that would impact how, with the quality of life here in the city of New Orleans. So it was a great experience. And you know so often that uh, we don't really realize uh, the impact of civil district court. Well, we, we always hear about criminal court, yes, but we don't realize about the impact of civil district court, yes. Civil district court is the place where civil matters are resolved. And as I said, it involves families uh, when there's divorce, custody issues, uh, child support issues. And then there's the uh, aspect where individuals can have their individual kinds of uh, issues resolved. Contracts, disputes, where your probate matters are handled. Uh, those instances where there has been some medical malpractice, those kinds of suits. And of course you can have those suits involving issues that involve the public at large, uh, whether or not there's a particular zoning issue when those are appealed. So they impact our lives greatly. It's just that it doesn't get as much publicity as uh, a criminal court case kind of does. Right, and currently you, uh, you, you, uh, you, you practice. And, you, and you're involved in mediation? Yes, yes. Uh, I've been involved in mediation since I'm, my retirement from Civil District Court in 2006. Mediation is bas basically described as alternative dispute resolution. And what it does is gives the opportunity for parties who are in litigation to have their cases resolved without a trial with a judge and or a jury. Uh, the parties have a, a neutral party, a mediator, and they come in and present their issues to the mediator. And the mediator's job is not to decide the case for them, but it is the opportunity for them to work through their issues, look at what the strengths and weaknesses are of their cases, look at what the uh, atmosphere may very well look like in the, in the scope of a trial, and come up with a settlement of the cases. Uh, this gives the parties what I describe is their one and only opportunity to control the outcome. Because if you try a case, uh, it goes to a judge or a jury, and they make the decision. You, the, your lawyers will put on the best case that they can possibly put on based on the facts and the law and the evidence that they have. And sometimes the outcome is not necessarily which, the one that you would hope for. But in a mediation, it gives you that process. There's no it's not recorded. As a matter of fact, all of the conversations at a mediation are held strictly confidential. So if the case does not settle, if it goes to trial, any conversations that were had during the course of the mediation are not discussed at trial. So people are free and open to discuss their issues. It gives the plaintiff who's brought the case an opportunity to express him or herself with regard to the issues. And sometimes, um, the defendants does not really know what the plaintiff is feeling with regard to a particular case. Sometimes, you know, they have the facts and the law and the evidence that's been put out there, but they really don't understand what the intimate feelings of the individual are. Because when you, even if you do a deposition, there are specific questions that you ask, and lawyers generally prepare their clients to ask the questions that have been answered. So it's really not an opportunity for people to really express 
their feelings about a particular case. Because sometimes people's feelings are just hurt. Uh, if their family member has been injured, they just want somebody to apologize. <laughs> and that can happen yes. in a mediation, but at the same time resolve the legal issue between them. So it's a good way. And plus, um, because of the cost of litigation these days, of hiring experts, of going to trial, and the cost of doing that, alternative dispute resolution is, as it says, an alternative to that. And people are using that more and more. Uh, it's become actually a section of the Louisiana Bar Association, of uh, the ABA Association, as well as the National Bar Association. So people are recognizing that it is kind of the way to go in the future. Because uh, and the other, other part of it is that courts really can't try every case that gets filed. Absolutely. But is, when is a case recommended for mediation? When you say when you say when you see a red flag, it's like, oh, bang. This should be, this is well, yes. Or is there, yes? There really isn't any specific rules. Louisiana law does not permit the judge to order mediation. However, the parties can request that the court uh, permit them to mediate a case. Uh, and sometimes parties just decide themselves without court intervention to mediate their case because they've looked at, you know, the evidence and the facts and they think that it's possible to resolve it. And it generally is. Most cases can be settled. Uh, even sometimes cases get settled right before they go to trial, but the alternative dispute resolution is an opportunity to do that before you get to the courthouse steps, so to speak. I would think that that would require uh, some uh, pretty savvy lawyers or lawyers who recommend, I say, I say savvy, but who's, who recognize that, wait a minute, let's just, uh, let's work this out. And, 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 it, and it does. Uh, as I said, when you have a case and you look at what the issues are and you make a determination as to how all, is all of this going to play out in front of a judge or a jury, and you make that decision based upon what you know about your case. Now, one of the things I think the public probably does not know is that everybody knows exactly what the case is about by the time you get to court. The plaintiff knows what the defendants are going to say. The defendants know what the plaintiffs are going to say. I think sometimes people think, oh, it only happens in the courtroom because that's what they see on TV. That really is not the case. Everybody knows pretty much what all the evidence is going to be before you ever get to trial. And so when you go to mediation, as I said, it gives you the opportunity to air out all of that information and take a look at your cases because sometimes whether you're the plaintiff's attorney or the defendant's attorney, you have lived with a particular case for a long period oh, of time yes. and your, your vision can somehow be jaded by your position. And so what the mediator does uh, is to try to get both sides to look at what the good things are about the case and what the not so good things are about the case. Because all cases have them. I mean, you may think <laughs> that you have the perfect case, but all cases have issues where uh, things may not be as clear as they they think that they are. And, and so it, mediation helps to resolve and that. It, that differs from arbitration? Yes, it does. Uh, arbitration is a, a judge decides it. In mediation, the parties arrive at the resolution of their case with some guidance of the mediator. Arbitration can also be binding on whatever decision the arbitrator makes that can be binding on either side. In a mediation, the parties agree, this is what we are going to do. This is how we're going to settle the case. If it involves a payment of some amount of money, they agree as to what that amount of money is going to be, when it's going to be paid, uh, any other costs that are going to be covered by the mediation. So it is different from arbitration in that way, in that an arbitrator actually decides the case. The arbitrator kind of sits as the judge of the case. Uh, uh, interesting, but and you also serve as uh, as uh, ad hoc sometimes. That's and, correct. Since my yes. retirement, the court, uh, the Supreme Court, by appointment, has uh, permitted me to preside over cases again. Uh, last year, for three two and a half months, I served at the twenty fourth judicial district court, there were some vacancies on there, and so those vacancies had to be filled until such time as there was an election. It was different in that I actually had to do criminal matters, which I had not done on the civil district court. Uh, I had a tutor to kind of get me up to speed on the criminal law because I hadn't practiced it, nor had I been uh, presiding over it. But it was truly an interesting experience. Now, how do you find the difference between the criminal side of the equation and the civil side? Uh, the, the criminal side of the equation, of course, someone's freedom is always at issue. 
uh, if they've committed a crime and you ha and the judge has to make some determination in some cases most criminal cases uh, are tried by jury but before the case gets to the jury the judge may have to decide on motion to suppress whether or not the evidence that's proposed to be presented at the trial has come in uh, according to law and so you have to make those preliminary decisions you have to make decisions about whether or not a person will get a bond or stay in jail until such time as his or her trial comes so you get those um, opportunities to make those decisions. And as I said, because a person's freedom is at jeopard in jeopardy, it is a serious matter. Not to say on the civil side, persons' individual uh, concerns are not uh, equally as important. But generally on the civil side, everybody kind of goes home at the end of the day. Whereas in a criminal case, that may not be the case depending on the outcome. What about the, the veracity and intensity? Because I would think... <laughs> Yeah. Well, one of the things, uh, I'll give you a, a little story. My son uh, was in college and he was called for jury duty at the criminal court. And he, though he didn't ex uh, tell me about the facts of the case, he says, Mama, how do you determine when somebody is actually telling you the truth? And I said, son, one of the ways that a judge has to, to do that is to listen to what they have to say and to make a determination as to whether or not what they say, what they are saying makes sense. Um, and whether or not they're changing their story. You also look at their demeanor on the stand. So it, it does become a, a challenge to really determine, because some people may very well be very good at not telling the truth. So you not... Professionals. You, <laughs> professionals, yeah. <laughs> but you have to be able to listen to what their stories are and to see in, or, in an ordinary experience whether or not what they're telling you makes sense. Uh, and sometimes people will come in and, and tell you stories that just don't make sense and you know they cannot be telling you the truth. So it's a process uh, by which, now am I always right? Maybe not, maybe not. But I have to make the best judgment I can with what information I have before me to make a, a, arrive at a decision. Well, as a judge then and now, retired judge and, and also when you sit ad hoc, your temperament on the bench. Well, I have been told that I have an even temperament, <laughs> and, and when one of my law clerks told me when, she, uh, when I was on the Civil District Court bench, she said, Judge, some days I needed to put on my mommy hat. I'm a mother of three children, so it gives you an opportunity to, again, you have to be a good listener, and you have to internal, uh, take in what they're saying and make some judgment on that. Uh, I was generally over, even keeled when I was on the bench. I would listen to what a, an individual had to say. I would repeat to them what my understanding of what they have said to me, and then I'd rule. I am, as a basic part of my personality, I'm a decisive person, so I listen and then I make a decision. Uh, and as a trial court judge, of course, our subject, our opinions, and that's just all they are, opinions, <laughs> Uh, are subject to review by the courts of appeal, whether it's the circuit court or whether it's the Supreme Court. So uh, my job was to listen to the facts, listen to the evidence, look at what the law says and arrive at a decision and, and give that decision to the parties. And if they agree with my decision, they can, uh, you know, they, it becomes a final decision. And if not, then they have a right to an appeal. Yes, and again, I would like to remind my viewing audience that I'm Gary Clark, and I'm speaking with my friend, retired Judge Carolyn Gill Jefferson, and who is retired from the, from the Civil District Court here in the city of New Orleans. And yes, uh, Judge Jefferson, you know, I've known you for, for a while, and uh, you're, you're a friend of the program and a friend of the community, but will you please tell us the Carolyn Gill Jefferson story? Well, I'm the eldest of five children. I was born in Canton, Mississippi. Uh, went to my, my undergraduate career was at Tougaloo College in a little small town called Tougaloo, Mississippi. We all know Tougaloo. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yes. um, after graduation from Tougaloo, I moved to New Orleans because I had applied to Loyola University Law School, was admitted, and I actually had the opportunity, I worked my way through law school. I worked at Loyola and went to law school at night. Uh, graduated from law school in uh, December of 1978, and 35 years ago, I was admitted to the Louisiana Bar. Uh, I, as I told you earlier, I went on the bench in 2006, but prior to that time, I worked for Legal Services, which was my first legal job. I was a, an attorney on the West Bank working for Legal Services. 
And after that, uh, I went into private practice for a short while, worked for the Attorney General's office, and then went on the bench for 12 years. Now, subsequent to that, I have been uh, an instructor, law professor, actually, at the Mississippi College School of Law in Jackson. And I did that for two years. Uh, and I taught Louisiana courses because Lu uh, Mississippi College has what they call a civil law program. So I taught Louisiana courses and just finished teaching a family law class <laughs> online, which was an interesting <laughs> experience. Uh, along with the mediation, I've done that. And I've also been able to expand my career to do what's called special master work. And special master work comes from, by appointment from the judges of the trial court bench. And we're actually an extension of the court. So I've done that, and as I said, along with raising three children. Oh yes, and and I know at Loyola, that was you had some powerful people that came out of Loyola during that period in the law program. Yes, uh, we did. It was a good good class of young lawyers. Yeah, it was. Yes. And what was interesting, just a few weeks ago, the city of New Orleans celebrated uh, the first 100 women in New Orleans uh, lawyers. And we didn't get to 100 until 1974 in New Orleans. <laughs> and, uh, and it was interesting to look at the list. Uh, some of the women had been my uh, law professors at uh, Loyola. Uh, others I have known as mentors, uh, Judge Joan Bernard Armstrong, who's currently retired, uh, Justice Bur Chief Justice Burnett Joshua Johnson, uh, who, was always, who was also served on the Civil District Court with me as well. Those were people who were part of that first 100 women lawyers in New Orleans. Uh, and it was interesting to note that it took us from the 1800s to 1974 to get 100 law women lawyers in the city of New Orleans. Uh, amazing. And, and I'm glad you mentioned some of the individuals there. Who else were some individuals who were personal and professional influences for you along the way? Well, I guess the, probably the people who had the most influence on me were both were my parents. Uh, my, as I said, I grew up in Mississippi, and we had a farm. I grew up on a farm, and we raised vegetables and cotton and corn and the like. Um, neither of my parents had a college degree, but their goal in life was that all five of their children were going to get college degrees. And it, when we grew up, it wasn't an issue of whether or not you were going to college. It was a question of where. And all five of us did, in fact, go to college and, and graduate. Uh, when I moved to New Orleans, as I said, in terms of my legal career, I wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was 12 years old. And growing up in Mississippi, there were no black lawyers, let alone any female lawyers. There was one white female lawyer in my hometown. But I always wanted to do that. I thought it was a, a means of being able to help people, and it is, and it continues to be, notwithstanding the, the bad jokes that people make about <laughs> lawyers uh, and the like, but yeah. it has been truly for me a rewarding profession. Um, my mentors in the profession were women like, as I said, Judge Armstrong, Judge Ernestine Gray, Chief Justice Johnson, uh, judges like Judge Miriam Walzer, who served on the criminal court bench. These were women who pioneered in being uh, not only just lawyers, but good judges. They were conscientious about their work. Um, they were fair in their rendition of their judge in their judgments. And so they were women who I wanted to emulate. Uh, and it gave, and, and of course, coming to New Orleans, I had some family here, but not many. So it gave, these women kind of took you under their wing and showed you what it meant to be a good lawyer, not just a female lawyer or not just a black lawyer, but a good lawyer. And then for me, and then it transformed into being a good judge. And they were there to answer questions for you, uh, and they showed you how to do it. No, I know you, you're highly involved in the community, and, and you really uh, engage yourself in this thing called civic engagement. Uh, what propelled you to be so civically involved? Well. It's a, a chance to give others an opportunity um, to grow and develop into whatever individuals they wanted to be. As I said, I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s in Mississippi, and there were few uh, choices that you could have. You know, you were teachers or whatever. And I want young people to understand that there's a whole lot of things out here that you can do, but you must prepare yourself. And I think that's one of the most disheartening things that I see in the community at large is this unwillingness for preparation, uh, for education, 
a work ethic. Um, all of those things are important and certainly at the top of the list is to have a faith. Uh, because one of the things we all know that there will be difficulties of life, but you certainly have to have the wherewithal to be able to withstand those and go on and move forward. And it's important, and I think that is my concern for young people today, is that they have a sense of work ethic, a sense of preparation, and certainly, of course, they have some faith in themselves and in their, in their God. Well, I like the fact that you mentioned preparation because uh, if you don't have the capacity, then, then, then everything you do is null and void. I, I always like to follow that. Uh, the adage that of, of uh, Moses, the hero in the crowd, you know, Moses understood the fact that he had to, he had to seize the moment. But you can't seize the moment if you're not prepared. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. and that you know, and that was one of the things that was key when in practicing law. You have to be prepared. You have to know what your case says, and then you have to know what the other side has has to say as well. And so that's one of the things that that disturbs me is that we have a lack of preparation. And preparation can come by observation, come by reading, and of course just by doing. You can watch others do and get yourself prepared. That's the way it is. Even, you know, if, if, if you want to be a tennis player or a golfer, whatever you want to do, they always say, watch another golfer. Watch another tennis player. Someone has your same physique and see what they do. Well, let's look at this. Uh, when you were uh, and when you are on the bench, uh, how do you see attorneys who may come sometimes, who you may say some are overly prepared, and some do you see, when you see one that perhaps may not be ready? Uh, yes. it, it is disturbing when an, an attorney is not prepared. One of the things, because I'll, I'll just kind of back up. When a case gets filed, the, the, the court looks at what the petition is to see what the claims are, and you can review it. And then the other party who has been sued has an opportunity to, to answer it. And so you look at that as well to see what their claims are. Sometimes lawyers have different positions on things, and you have to write. Uh, you have to say, oh, this, I presented this particular claim to the court. These are the reasons why I believe this, this claim should be satisfied. And so lawyers have an opportunity to write what we call memoranda to give us an outline of what cases that are like theirs have been decided by the uh, courts of appeals and in some instances the Supreme Court. I find that some lawyers don't go, don't do the research, don't prepare, and come in expecting a favorable result. <laughs> well, you can't get a favorable result without preparation. Uh, when those items, when the memos were presented to me, I made my best efforts to read them, to understand when they walk into court to present those arguments to me, I knew what they were talking about. I didn't waste a lot of time for them to regurgitate to me the facts of their case. I wanted to know what their legal arguments were that would sustain them. And so we don't waste time. Uh, lawyers have more than one case. Judges have more than one case. So it's important to value time. I value time, so that's why I read it. I had some understanding of, of their issues. And I would say to them, this is my understanding of your issues. And if I was wrong, I would give them an opportunity to correct my misunderstanding of their situations. But it's important that you prepare, that you're able to intelligently discuss the issues before the court. And it's not just uh, in a legal setting. If you're, whatever a person is doing, you need to be able to articulate what your position is. If you go to w work on a job, I'm sure that most jobs have handbooks. You need to read that. So if an issue comes up, then you can address that issue from an intelligent uh, point of view. You may not always be successful in it, but at least you are prepared for it. I think so many people, young people, and some others, are lost on the fact that they need to be aware of the, of the situ work environments that they're in, social environments as well. It's the preparation. It, nothing beats oh, yes. that. Now, in the remaining minutes that we have, what do you see as the critical issues facing the justice system? Uh, today and I know you know on the, on the bench you know, there are sometimes things you can and cannot say but you know now you well I think you, one of the things yes. that that is facing the courts now is for one access courts have to be able to 
run and they need the finances to run. So one of the things we want to be careful about is not uh, denying folk access to the courts. Uh, the indigent particularly, whether oh, that's yes. on the criminal side yes. or whether or not that is on the civil side. Under our law in Louisiana, the courts can't appoint attorneys to represent indigents, but we have, uh, the courts are setting up um, groups where they can assist individuals to file their own cases, answer questions for them. Under the Constitution of the Louisiana and the United States, if a person cannot afford an attorney in a criminal setting, the court is bound to appoint an attorney for it. But it doesn't work on the, on the civil side. So what we have to do is to be able to have resources for them to be able to get representation. As I told you, when I began my career, I worked for legal services, and that's what we did, was to provide legal services for indigents who had civil issues. The, uh, and it was funded by the Legal Services Corporation, which was a federally funded program, but it too has been gutted. Right now, we had offices on the West Bank, St. Bernard, uh, in St. Charles Parish. Now there's only one Legal Services Corporation that's serving the entire Southeast, and it's... Uh, wow. So it's and been I remember cut. Legal Services was so great. Yes. Absolutely. And those services have been cut back, of course, by budget cuts and the like. So what we have to do as a community is to make access to justice possible for those on the civil side who cannot afford it. And on the criminal side as well, because they have had issues with funding for the indigent defender boards and the like. So it's important that the justice system be just that justice for all, because that's part of the creed of this country. And it not it's not going to be justice for all if those who cannot financially afford it are denied it because of the mere fact that they don't have the funds. And to I do also so. want you to reflect uh, with me uh, about the nature of, of blacks in the justice system uh, on all levels, because you know so many so oftentimes we see ourselves you know at the bottom tier, but the, the role and value of having black justices. That has been important. Justices, yes. uh, uh, it is true. Uh, it does have a make a difference, and I think when people walk in and they see someone who looks like them, that does not mean that they are automatically going to be successful in their outcome. But it certainly will give them a, 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 a sense of perhaps they may understand what my plight is. Doesn't make doesn't. Uh, in my mind, in one instance, uh, indicate that they're going to be successful. But it does say, well, maybe they will have some understanding of what my situation is. I think that is not only true with not only having African Americans on the bench, but I think it's true with having women on the yes. bench of all races, creeds, and colors, because we are a diverse uh, society, and our justice system ought to reflect that. And I think it's important that and it's important for our young people too, to see individuals who are in positions who look like them, and that gives them a sense of encouragement that they too can do that. And I think we're going to see more females on the bench a whole lot we because have a lot. there's was, so many in the law schools now. So, I mean, <laughs> yes. And, and, and when I was on the bench, the women were the majority yes, of, of the members of the bench. And we are getting there. Uh, I just would like to encourage any young person, whether or not they're male or female, if that's something that you want to do, work at it. Do what's necessary. You know, they complain about the fact that it takes too long to go to school, but it's all worth it. Oh, yes. And I want to thank you for joining me. Thank and you, Dr. Clark, oh, for having me. Yes, yes, yes. And again, this is, this is uh, Dr. Clark's reports, and as always, it's been a pleasure.